Welcome. Um, my name is Henry Zhao, and I'd like to welcome you to the Veritas Forum at the University of Chicago. Thank you. So the name of the forum Veritas is Latin for truth, and we want to seek truth together tonight as we ask life's most difficult questions and explore our deepest beliefs. So we have come together to consider the perennial topic of happiness, what it is, how it is viewed by disciplines as distinct as philosophy and economics, and whether it is any good to ourselves and to society. Our hope is that this event serves as a starting point to um, explore and test our worldviews together. If, through this event, the University of Chicago grows as a place where we could foster a culture of honest consideration and respect with people who hold different views, then we will have considered this event worthwhile. So, before we begin, we ask that you take out your phones and first please silence them and then go to slido.com. Um, that is S L I D O, slido.com. And I believe everybody should have a little card on your seat or under your seat that gives the instructions. But please go to the website and enter the event code UChicago Veritas. There will be no need to register. Um, you only need to enter the event code to join the platform. Again, the event code is UChicago Veritas. During the Q&R section, we will be uh, using Slido to collect questions from you to post to the interlocutors. So during the event, if you have any question or if any um, theme interests you and you would like to consider it further, please use the platform to post your own questions and also to upvote or downvote the questions that you will see on the platform. And again, Samantha and I will be using, um, will be using the questions that we collect from you that, are, that have the highest votes to post to the interlocutors later tonight. So let's take a moment to join the Slido platform. So tonight, as we consider what good is happiness, first we're going to hear from Jennifer Frey of the University of South Carolina, followed immediately by Jonathan Masser from the University of Chicago. Then moderator David Barr will, both, will ask both speakers a few questions before we move on to the Q&R section. And we call it Q&R, which stands for question and response, because although we're committed to seeking truth, we recognize that our search must be marked with a certain degree of humility. Now I'd like to take a moment to introduce our moderator for the evening, David Barr. David is a scholar of Christian social and political ethics with a particular interest in the environment. He earned his BA in environmental studies from the college here and a PhD in religious ethics from the Divinity School here, as well as a master's in religious ethics from Yale. As a teaching fellow at the Divinity School, David offers classes in the college on big questions in religious ethics, including a class this spring on the question, uh, is humanity doomed? Um, which will be a great question for Veritas. Next time. So please join me in welcoming David Barr. Uh, thank you very much, Henry. And uh, can everyone hear me? Great. Um, Thank you so much, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so glad that you're here. Uh, it's my honor to introduce our uh, speakers this evening. Um, first, we have Jennifer Frey. She's assistant professor of philosophy at the University of South Carolina. She was previously a, college, a collegiate assistant professor of humanities at the University of Chicago, where she was a member of the Society of Fellows in the Liberal Arts and an affiliated faculty in the philosophy department. Frey holds a PhD uh, from the University of Pittsburgh and a BA from Indiana University Bloomington. She was the co-principal investigator on a major three-year research project titled Virtue, Happiness, and Meaning of Life. Jen is an active public scholar running her own philosophy and literature podcast entitled Sacred and Profane Love. Next to her, 
Uh, Jonathan Mazur is the John P. Wilson Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. He's also the David and Celia Hilliard Research Scholar and the founding director of the Wachtell Lipton Rosen and Katz Program in Behavioral Law, Finance, and Economics. I'm proud of myself for that sentence. Uh, <laughs> he received uh, undergraduate degrees in physics and uh, political science from Stanford University in 1999 and a JD from Harvard Law School in 2003. He clerked for Chief Judge Marilyn Hall Patel of the United States District Court for the Northern District of California and for Judge Richard Posner of the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. He joined the law school faculty in 2007 and served as Deputy Dean from 2012 to 2014. Razor's research and teaching interests include patent law, administrative law, behavioral law, and economics, and criminal law. So please welcome me, please join me in welcoming tonight's guest. So to begin, what is happiness? <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm a philosopher, uh, but it's not like I, it's not like my view about what happiness is represents my discipline. Philosophers uh, don't agree about anything uh, about happiness, least of all. But I'll just tell you how I have come to think about what happiness is in a very general way. Um, I think that. One thing that Jonathan and I do agree about is that everybody wants to be happy, um, everybody wants to be fulfilled or satisfied with their lives. Um, so we just take that for granted, take it to be a good thing. Um, but the hard existential philosophical question is, what's actually gonna make you happy? What is happiness actually consistent? How should we think about happiness? given that we're human beings. What is happiness for a human being like? And the tradition that I sort of think with and do work in is the Aristotelian Thomist tradition, so Aristotle and Aquinas. And when they think about happiness, um, they don't take themselves to be doing theory construction or to really be doing anything theoretical. Um, it's part of their practical philosophy. Um, and the goal of practical philosophy isn't simply to know or to explain, um, but to make people become good and live well. That's the goal of, of practical philosophy. And so happiness is, insofar as it's theorized, is theorized with that very practical goal in mind, and that is my concern. I think that ethics isn't um, mainly a, a theoretical enterprise, but a practical enterprise, what we're interested in is the question, how should I live? What kind of person do I actually want to be? Um, and so I think that when we're thinking and reflecting about happiness or living a good human life, we're really asking ourselves how we should aspire to live and what sort of human being do you most want to be? Um, and so I think of happiness uh, like Aristotle in terms of the highest good. Um, so what would it look like to embody human excellence, to realize it in my own life, in my own particular unique circumstances, in communities, with other people who also want to be happy? Now, Aristotle and Aquinas take it to be obvious that whatever an excellent sort of human life is, it's going to be really demanding. This is a feature of their view, not a bug, in my opinion. Um, so they have a a notion of happiness that allows for heroism and self-sacrifice uh, for the sake of higher common goods. It allows that sacrifice and suffering um, can, be, can be beautiful and awe-inspiring. Um, you know, that, that, you would give, that you would give up something really valuable to you for the sake of a higher common good is something that they take um, to be worthwhile and meaningful. And they also think that virtue, you know, exercising virtue and acquiring virtue will involve a certain amount of, of suffering and that our suffering isn't meaningless, um, that it can have meaning and value and in fact it can almost be a kind of purifying thing. It sort of burns off the obstacles um, in your character that are holding you back um, from achieving your true excellence. Um, so this, this traditional conception of happiness is really concerned with self-transcendence. 
it's concerned with transcending this kind of cramped space of the protective self, um, where you're really only concerned about your individual well-being. Because the idea is that, look, if what's guiding your life is just self-interest, then you're not actually going to be able to live a life that's worthy of imitation, because you're never going to know the deeper, more fulfilling joys of the highest sorts of human goods, so the goods that pertain to loving human relationships and friendships and, of course, contemplation. Um, and another thing that I want to say about happiness is that Aristotle and Aquinas both think that reflection on human excellence has to be grounded in a shared self-understanding of the kind of thing that we are, like what kind of thing is the human being, what sort of potential does the human person have inherent to it to realize uh, its own excellence. And one thing that seems really clear to Aristotle and Aquinas is that we're social, political creatures. So we don't actually come to be fully human outside of a community, but we certainly also don't flourish outside of human communities. Um, and this means that it was sort of obvious to them that our happiness isn't a private good. Um, so you can just think of a private good as the kind of good whose benefit just redounds to you as an individual. Um, and Aristotle and Aquinas think of happiness as a, as a common good. In fact, they say it's the highest common good. And there's a lot you could say about common goods, but there are three basic features of common goods that I think are important to highlight when thinking about happiness as a common good. Uh, the first is that it's just common to you in virtue of being a human being. Um, the second is that it's not a competitive good. Right, so my pursuit of happiness should in no way detract from your pursuit of happiness. It's not like the milk in the store, there's just so much milk in the store. If I get some milk in the store, there's less milk in the store for you. It's not like that. Um, and the third thing, and this is really, I think, the most important thing is that common goods are both brought about and enjoyed together. So the best way that I can think of to illustrate this is to think about a symphony playing like Beethoven's Ninth. So no single member of the symphony can bring it into being. I mean, they can only play their part. Um, but in order for the symphony to, be, to come to be, every person has to play their part. So every member of the symphony is a participant in creating this good but they also enjoy it together, right? I mean, you can really only enjoy uh, the symphony um, when you're all bringing it about together. And Aristotle and Aquinas think of happiness like that. It's a, it's a common good. Um, they also connect happiness to virtue, to the cultivation of virtue. And they connect the cultivation and exercise of virtue to friendship. Um, so they have a really capacious understanding of friendship. Um, it's not just like your best friends or your friends on campus. Um, the parent-child relationship is a kind of friendship. Spousal relationships are a kind of friendship. It's basically any kind of relationship in which you have shared activities together, where you enjoy goods together, and you have a kind of mutual affection or love for one another, and you will the good of your friend, right? Um, and the idea is that when I grow in the virtues and I deepen my friendships with other people, I come to see my own happiness as inextricably bound up with the happiness of my friends. So if I think about if my friends are happy, I'm happy. If my kids are happy, I'm happy. If my kids are suffering, I'm suffering. Why? Because I love them. Because I see that my happiness depends on theirs. I'm not happy on my own. I'm happy with them. And they have a broader conception of philia or civic friendship. This is the basis of justice and common life together. And Aquinas has a, a notion of caritas, um, which is the root of life with God. But in each of these cases, uh, whether it's philia or caritas, I see myself right as a part 
or a participant in something that's much greater than myself, right? As a member of a political community, or in the case of Aquinas, maybe a member of the mystical body of Christ. But it's this participatory relationship, right? This ability to see my life um, in relation to something that is self-transcendent, that gives my life a kind of really deep joy and lasting fulfillment, uh, meaning, and purpose. So again, this is a vision of happiness that's sort of like wide and deep. It's also very demanding. Um, but the main part that I want to stress is it's a vision of happiness in which we flourish together, right? We don't flourish alone. Um, I'm not going to argue for this vision of happiness, um, but I do want you to try to think about um, whether or not you sort of have intuitions that this is a vision of happiness that you want to accept. And in order to get your intuitions going, I'm going to rely on a thought experiment that I think you're pretty familiar with um, from the literature, and that is the idea of a, of a kind of pleasure machine. So you can imagine like a virtual reality machine in which the line between reality and simulation has just become completely blurred. So if you get into this machine, then you're going to experience all and only pleasures. You're only going to have um, subjectively positive affect. Um, and you're going to think that everything that you experience is good and real. Now, the reality is you're sort of lying alone, inert, and your brain is being manipulated, right? You're not actually having, um, you're not actually in communion with like real human goods, but you think that you are. It seems to you to be totally real. And so the question is, would you want to get in that machine? Does that seem like a life that is worthy of imitation? Would you want to tell small children to aspire to such a life? Does that seem uh, beautiful or worthy of admiration? Um, or does it seem like a cop-out? Now, if you are a subjectivist about happiness, I think that you have a hard time explaining what would be wrong with getting into such a machine. Um, like, why should you really care about human excellence at all, why not just get into the machine or take a happiness pill and call it a day? Um, because look, according to subjectivism, if, if happiness really is just a positive affective state, then you could be manipulated into that state, right? And if all that really matters is being in that state, then it doesn't really matter the way things really are. It doesn't matter if you are having some sort of real experience of a human good. Um, and there's really no way to make a principled distinction between false happiness or a simulation of happiness and true and deep happiness. And I think one of the clear benefits of the Aristotelian position is that we do have an external measure because you cannot separate happiness, being truly and deeply fulfilled and satisfied with actual communion with real human goods. It has to be grounded in that. Um, so my problem with subjectivism about happiness is it's based on a dualism, right? There's a dualism between happiness and the reality of the good, uh, but there's also a dualism between individual benefit and objective good. And I think that one of the values of, I mean, one of the principal insights of the Aristotelian view of happiness is that, look, insofar as you feel subjectively satisfied or deeply fulfilled in your life, it will be because you actually are attaining your good. And the only way that you can get that is through the cultivation of virtue, right? How does virtue operate in you, right? Well, the cultivation of virtue is a kind of deep transformation of a human person. And what does it do? 
it makes you fit to enjoy what is truly excellent in human life. So on this view, there is no dualism between morality and happiness. Rather, the idea is that, look, the point or the purpose of the moral life, of a human life, is to be happy, right? It's to live an excellent human life together with others, and there's no other goal that would be worthy of our devotion and aspiration. That's my view. <laughs> Uh, Jennifer, that was wonderful. Thank you. There's so much. Uh, there was so much there in those rich comments. I'm not going to be able to cover even a fraction of it, but this is a great place to get us started. Um, and, and let me just say, I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to be talking with you uh, and talking to all of you. So um, I begin with a sort of psychological conception of happiness. Um, so think about all the emotions that you might feel in the course of your life, all the thoughts you might have, anger, anxiety pleasure, contentment, satisfaction, and so on and so forth. Um, they're all very different in a lot of different ways, but they're all sort of, they can be arrayed along a one dimension at least, where there's one dimension that they at least have in common, which is they're all either bad or good to some degree. Some of these emotions are things that, that make you feel good, that you would want to seek out, that you would want to make part of your life. Some of these emotions and thoughts are things that will make you feel unhappy, that you want to try to avoid and minimize to the greatest degree possible. So being angry is obviously very different than feeling the great anxiety about a test you have to take or something like that. But they're both negative in a way that you, you, you're, they're not making, you're not giving you any satisfaction or joy while you're having them. You want to avoid them. You wouldn't say while you're feeling great anxiety that everything is going wonderfully for you. And at the same time, the sort of immediate pleasure that you might feel from you know, watching a great TV show is different than the kind of deep sense of contentment that you might have by being surrounded by a lot of your friends or sort of the kind of general warmth you might feel when you talk to your parents on the phone after not having spoken to them in a while or something like that. But in all of those cases, we would say that's a positive feeling of a sort. You, you're getting a lot out of it, you're enjoying it, you want it to be part of your life. And while you're having that feeling, you would say, yes, that's, this, this is good for me. Um, my life is going better because of that feeling I'm having. So those positive feelings, that's what we would call happiness. And the negative feelings, whatever form they take, that's what we would call unhappiness. And so the first myth I want to dispel is that happiness is synonymous with sort of pleasure of the most kind of basic or um, simple form. You know, happiness is the feeling that you get when you hand in that paper you've been working on for three weeks. It's not just the feeling that you get when you eat something sweet or when you, you know, win at the video game you're playing. Um, and happiness also, I mean, you know, the best kinds of happiness, they don't just last for a fleeting moment. Um, you know, the, the happiness that you feel when you have great friends around you who you see a lot, that's a long-term, ongoing sort of happiness that fills up many, many moments in your life. It's very different than the happiness you might get when you, you know, watch a quick three-minute video on YouTube that you kind of enjoy. So um, I was actually at an academic conference many years ago, and uh, another legal academic put up his hand in the audience and said, doesn't your theory imply that we would all be better off if we ate a bucket of fried chicken, snorted a lot of cocaine, and died? Um, <laughs> and, and the answer to that is no. <laughs> because even though all of that might make you really happy in that moment, might, I don't really know, not having tried that combination of things, um, <laughs> it, even though it might make you very happy in that moment, then that moment is over, and you don't get to experience any other greater long-lasting happiness down the line. Okay, so that's the sort of psychological conception of happiness that we have. Positive feelings of all different sorts, of all different textures, short-lived, long-lived, etc. All of those are constitutive of happiness. The, the more philosophical claim that I want to make is that happiness, being happy in that way, having positive feelings, is what it means to live a life that is sort of good for you. It's what it means to have a lot of welfare for yourself, or a lot of well-being. So think about, um, I'm gonna pick someone at random, think about Bill Gates. 
Bill Gates has a lot of money. Bill Gates has a loving family. Bill Gates doesn't have to work very hard. Bill Gates is also doing all sorts of charitable works and things that probably give him a lot of satisfaction and pleasure. Bill Gates is living a life that is good for Bill Gates. He has a lot of welfare. He has a lot of well-being. But the, the important distinction I want to draw is that living a life that is good for you in the sense of having a lot of happiness and thus having a lot of welfare is not the same as living a life that is good in a moral or virtuous sense. If all you did was spend your entire life focusing on yourself and trying to garner as much happiness as you could for yourself, you might attain a lot of welfare, but you wouldn't be what we would call a good or moral person. You'd be a narcissist who cared only about yourself. A good life in a sort of more moral sense surely involves caring greatly not just about your own welfare, but about the welfare of the people surrounding you. So what I want to say, what I want to make very clear is that when I talk about happiness as constitutive of the good life for that person, I don't mean good in a moral sense. I just mean what it means to say that someone's life is going well for them, which is very different than saying that they are living a good life and being a valuable and productive member of a society. The other thing I want to be careful to say is that the way to achieve the greatest happiness in your life is probably not just to spend your whole life pursuing the greatest happiness for your own life. Probably many of you have had the experience of like sitting down and playing you know, 12 hours straight of video games, or maybe that's just me, but um, I would imagine I'm not the only person in this room. And that's, you know, that's, like a, that's a thing that we would do to try to generate the greatest amount of happiness for ourselves. I'm going to talk about 12 hours of video games again in just a second. Um, but I'm sure we've all had the experience that after hour number something or other, it ceases to be quite so much fun. Um, it, it, it runs out. Same thing with you know, your favorite food. You might have a favorite food. You're not going to want to eat it every single day or three meals every single day. After a while, that food is going to cease being so delicious to you, it's going to cease bringing you the positive feelings and emotions that might come with eating it normally. So the way to be happiest in life is not just to sort of go from moment to moment seeking out the greatest and most pleasurable thing that you can attain. It's to do something else with your life. It's to do something that's often, in many cases, but not necessarily, deeper and richer and allows you to build more long-lasting connections and things that will bring you greater happiness over the longer term. So happiness is not about just the fleeting moment. It's not about only doing what is good for yourself all the time. It's just a way of thinking about whether someone's life is going well by their own lights for them. Um, and then we can start to talk about what we can all do to sort of increase the happiness of the people around us um, and the happiness of our community as a whole. Okay, so. I want to sort of, I'm going to say this in a way that's kind of posing the question to Jennifer, but I, I obviously sort of mean it as a statement as well. So a lot of what Jennifer said about sort of the way that we could think of happiness as a communal good or a social good or something like that, I think there are two ways of understanding those types of claims. One way of understanding them is as sort of empirical or psychological claims. The idea that it is hard to be happy, or we are most typically happy when the people around us, especially the people we care about, are happy as well. So I have two children. I will say that if my two children, as I am constantly telling them, if they're not happy, then I'm not happy. And if they're happy, then I'm happy. Their happiness and my happiness are 100% intertwined. So in many cases, the thing that I can do to make myself happiest is to try to make them happiest, a fact which they have learned to exploit. Um, <laughs> so and that's a case where the, the, the nature of the closest of our social ties means as a psychological fact that their happiness is very much determinant of mine. Um, contrast that slightly with, let's say, my criminal law students, some of whom are in this room. Uh, in a few weeks, when I am preparing to uh, write and then give them my criminal law exam, they will probably be unhappy because they will be anxious and they'll be studying a lot and they'll realize that like all that stuff I taught them last quarter doesn't make any sense anymore. It will be bad. They will be unanxious. They will be uh, resentful of me, maybe. Who knows? All these sorts of feelings. Um, all of that will affect me somewhat. I am sad when my students are sad. But will it really diminish my happiness as much as my children's unhappiness does? Probably not. It will cut into it a little bit, but not that much. And then, a week later, when they're done taking the exam and I'm grading the exams, 
I would be deeply miserable, <laughs> deeply miserable grading all their exams. And will they care that I'm deeply miserable? Will my misery affect them while they are on spring break? It will not. <laughs> so as a sort of psychological matter then, our happinesses are less intertwined. Another way of understanding these claims about sort of happiness as a social phenomenon is as a philosophical claim, a sort of like a deeper truth that, you know, no one can be happy without the community being happy or is, is our happiness compounds itself. And there I think I would probably take issue. I, I don't understand the idea that one person can't be happy without someone else in their, type, in their community being happy as well. And I think that my one L's on spring break would, uh, would sympathize or agree with that view as well. Okay, so then the last thing I want to talk about um, and, then I'll, and then I'll stop is, uh, I wanted to get to Jennifer's um, example of the experience machine, which she brought up at the end, the machine that we plug ourselves into and that, uh, that makes us happy and gives us positive feelings. So the experience machine is probably the most famous thought experiment in all of philosophy. It is the number one argument that gets trotted out against uh, people like me who think that happiness is the way to understand what it means to have a good life. Um, but I have some problems with the experience machine. So number one, um, number one, I don't, uh, I don't think that when we think about the experience machine, when you're imagining the thought experiment that Jennifer described to you, you're probably imagining a lot of things. You're imagining yourself hooked up to a bunch of wires, unmoving, as opposed to yourself actually sort of experiencing what was going on. You're imagining yourself being cut off from all the actual people in your life right now that you might care about, cut off from your parents, your siblings, your friends, your partners, etc. And all of those things sound deeply unpleasant. And so to the extent that people reject the experience machine, and by the way, not everyone does, to the extent that people reject the experience machine, I think that in many cases they're rejecting it for reasons that are outside of what we're really talking about. They're rejecting it for reasons that have nothing to do with whether it's good or bad to have this kind of feeling or that sort of pleasure. They're rejecting it because it would mean sacrificing something in their actual life right now that they think that they would not want to give up. But I would submit to you that all of those problems aside, we spend lots of time plugging ourselves into mini experience machines all the time. We go to movies and immerse ourselves in another world where we're just sitting there and observer for a couple of hours. We watch television. We play video games, and so on and so forth. We're doing all sorts of things where we are not you know, actively running around doing stuff, but we're just sort of engaged in having an experience that brings us some amount of pleasure. And those aren't bad things. Now, I don't know if anyone would want to do that for their entire lives, because again, it would mean sacrificing so many other things that are important to us and bring us joy. Um, but nonetheless, it's hard to say, you know, no one would ever want to play a video game for an hour because that would be a false sense of happiness. I don't think that that's right. I mean, I think that is proven false by uh, our common experience in life. But of course, that's not to say that the way to be happy is to do that and nothing but that. As a psychological matter, the way to be happy is probably to go and have lots and lots of great experiences of all different types many of which involve doing things for other people. And when we do things for other people, that is the sort of thing that often brings us really great happiness as well. So happiness as a concept is a way of talking about how someone's life is going for themselves. But it's not a way of saying what it is to lead a good life, and it isn't necessarily even what it is to say, uh, it, it isn't necessarily even a way to say what it is to lead a life that encourages happiness in yourself. Often the things that bring us the greatest happiness are things we do for others and things we do with others. But I think of that as a psychological concept, a truth about human psychology and the way we interact with each other as people, not a necessary sort of philosophical precept. Like, other people are happy as loners. Other people are happy by themselves, doing things by themselves. So that's how I think of happiness. So I will just close now by posing my own thought experiment. So imagine um, a person named Sarah who decides that it's her life goal to run a marathon. She wants to complete a marathon. And um, so she, she just knows if she can fulfill this life goal, she will achieve such great satisfaction. She will have had a wonderful life. And for the rest of her life, she will look back upon the completion of her marathon as a great and wonderful achievement. And she will smile and be happy about it. So Sarah begins training. And the training is arduous. She hates running, she's not in the best shape, she has shin splints, it's just miserable, it's terrible. So she runs all the time, and she really hates every moment of it, but she drives herself forward with admirable tenacity because she imagines what it will be like to finish that marathon and have the satisfaction of having done so. The marathon day arrives. She begins running her marathon, 26.2 miles. 
It is terrible. She is miserable every step of the way. She loathes running. She can't feel like she's enjoying herself, but she just knows that she can only reach the end of it. She will achieve such incredible, great satisfaction. So here she is. She's striving. She's struggling. She's trying to achieve something that is sort of canonically human. She runs her marathon, and as her foot hits the finish line, she drops dead of a heart attack. So you could ask yourself, has Sarah lived a good life or not? She definitely struggled and suffered a lot. It was a very human experience. It wasn't being plugged into the experience machine. But she never got to have those positive feelings of satisfaction. She was denied the experience of living a life knowing that she had achieved this great goal. All she got was the suffering and none of the positive feelings afterwards. For a hedonist like me, that's a tragedy. Poor Sarah. Sarah didn't get the thing that she was striving for. She never got all the positive feelings that were supposed to be the reward at the end of it. But I think that there are a lot of Aristotelians who would tell you, hey, Sarah had it great. And the fact that she never got to have all those positive feelings at the end, that's just sort of collateral. So I think you know, that's, that's the other side of the experience machine. We have to ask ourselves, OK, you know, what are the sorts of things that we do think are valuable in life, and, and how are we going to go about achieving them? Great, thank you. Uh, Questions for me? Did you have a response to these questions? Um, sure. Uh, the first one's easy. It's a philosophical claim, of course. I'm a philosopher. Um, but let me defend that. Um, so I, for three years now, have been working with psychologists on questions about virtue and happiness and meaning in life. And um, I worked with one psychologist in particular who was developing a self-transcendence measure because there's a lot of literature, especially in personality psychology, that suggests that the higher you score on these self-transcendence measures, um, the more, basically, you have better mental health and you are able to find meaning and purpose in your life and stuff like this. Um, and so he's presenting this theory of what he's measuring, and, and um, at some point I just raised my hand and I was like, well look, well, what you're measuring I could obviously experience at a Nazi rally, right? I mean, these peak experiences, well, I could obviously have that in a Nazi rally, and, and it's also clear that, um, that not only is that conceptually possible, it seems actual in lots of humans that actually lived. And, um, and he was like, yeah, yeah, that is what I'm measuring. And I'm just like, well, you know, um, look, if that's, if that's what self-transcendence is, then we can't say that, that it's good, right? I mean, we can't say that you should be after just self-transcendent experiences, right? Because we don't want to endorse uh, going to Nazi rallies and things like this. Um, and so, um, because my claim is normative, and psychological claims are not normative, they're descriptive, it's a philosophical claim. Um, it's a claim about what human excellence actually is, and what a life worthy of imitation would look like. Now, in response to the Marathon case, the Aristotelian would not say that they were living well. They would say, you shouldn't devote your life to running a marathon. I mean, I've, I've, I've run marathons. They're fun. Um, I actually enjoyed my marathon quite a bit. I had a great time. Um, but, uh, but I mean, look, that's just not, um, you know, I mean, I had all kinds of reasons for doing it, but I have a, a life devoted um, to running a marathon poorly is just not a well-lived life. Um, so, and again, when we're thinking about what is a well-lived life, we're thinking about what is worthy of imitating, right? What inspires us? What we aspire to be, given the kind of thing that we are, and that's the space of reflection in which I'm thinking about happiness. Now, there's an obvious psychological component to that, right? Um, no Aristotelian would deny, and certainly I would not deny, that happiness involves um, 
a, a, a positive, a, a sense of deep fulfillment is the way that I would put it, um, which is connected to your ability to make sense of your life as a whole um, and to see it as, as something valuable uh, and noble. But um, it's not just a lump of positive experiences, right? There's a narrative arc and structure to a human life um, we have to make sense of our lives. Um, and that's part of what it means uh, to be happy, is to be able to do that. And, and I think that um, we have to have a robust enough conception of happiness. I mean, the thing is, if you think of happiness as just like part of a good life, you know, maybe it's over here, and then morality is over here, um, then you're constantly in your practical deliberation going to be asking yourself, well, should I be happy or should I be good? Um, and I think that sort of dualism within your theory of practical reason is something of a disaster. Um, I want a unified account of practical reason in which when your deliberation is going well, right, which I think it takes virtue in order uh, for that to happen, every part of you is aimed at, um, you know, what is, what is worthy of your life. Um, and so, so there would be a deep unity, and you're not constantly asking yourself, well, should I feel good? Or, you know, should I help my mom, right? Um, I don't know how you would possibly constantly be settling those sorts of, of trade-offs. And so I think it would be a benefit of a theory where you wouldn't have to. Uh, great, thank you. Um, so as you were talking, I was, I was thinking of this question. Um, one way of thinking about happiness that I don't think either of you are saying is that it's, it's getting what you want. It's desire satisfaction. Um, both of you have a, a sense in your work, I think, that someone could be wrong about what makes them happy, and that's part of why you do your, why you do your work, is to help clarify for people what, where to look to, you know, to find out what will actually make you happy. So uh, I guess that's the question. Where, if someone is, say, in college and wants to live a happy life, doesn't know where, or someone's, a, say, in policy and wants to make people happy, where do we look to discover the path to happiness? Or what happiness is? Um, well, I'll start by saying that getting what you want, desire, satisfaction, is certainly not the same thing as living, a, having a good life for you, having a lot of welfare. It's not the same thing as happiness. Um, although there will be a lot of overlap. So there's actually quite a lot of psychological evidence that people are often pretty bad at guessing what they're going to want. They think they want something, and it turns out that the thing that they thought they wanted, it just doesn't make them nearly as happy as they expected to. We make mistakes like that all of the time. Uh, there's a term for it in the psychological literature. They call it effective forecasting errors. You're trying to forecast your effective, meaning your hedonic or happiness states in the future. You're just bad at guessing at it, bad at predicting how you're going to feel. Um, so I think that's not the best way to think about what's going on. Uh, ideally, you know, if in a, in a more advanced world, we'd all, uh, you know, we'd all be hooked up to little machines that would be measuring our positive and negative feelings all the time. We can't do that, obviously. So what psychologists do now is they just ask people. They just ask people, how happy are you right now? Um, and there are various versions of this. There's a yearly survey, the General Social Survey in the United States that asks everybody each year, you know, take it as a whole, how is your life going for you this past year? You can survey a lot of people. The problem is that um, you're only surveying them once a year, so you're not really getting a precise look at things. It's sort of an overview. Um, there are actually um, much better methods that try to survey people sort of in the moment. What are you doing right now, and how happy are you doing it? Um, there is an app created by a psychologist called Track Your Happiness, where you put the app on your smartphone and it will sort of ping you every once in a while and ask you those questions and you answer it. And at the end of some number of weeks of this, the quid pro quo is that the app will spit out um, a record for you of the things that make you happiest and the things that make you least happy so that you can try to spend more time doing things that make you happy in your life. Um, I did this on my phone and it told me the thing that made me the happiest was talking to groups of students about happiness, so here I am. <laughs> So I think that's sort of the way to think about what it is that actually makes people, what it is that makes people happy, what it, makes, what it is that makes people's lives go well for them. I want to take a quick moment and say something about um, Jennifer's point about dualism, which I think is really interesting. And there are a lot, again, it's so rich, I, we could have a whole conversation about the Nazi rally example, which I'm very interested in. But let me just say something quickly about dualism. 
So, you know, let's imagine that it's really your roommate's turn to do the dishes, um, but you know that your roommate is uh, cramming for an exam and under a huge amount of stress. And so even though all the, dish, all the dirty dishes are his, you're gonna do them anyway. And so you sit down and you do all the dishes laboriously. So you've done a good thing for your roommate. You have performed a mitzvah. Um, you, it might be that you're feeling such warm glow about having done that that you actually enjoy the whole experience and you have positive feelings from it. Um, but it's, it's entirely possible that actually it makes you less happy, that you, it wasted time that you'd rather spend doing something else. I don't think that there's any problem with this idea that we could be doing a good thing for someone else while at the same time taking an action that reduces our own welfare, makes our own lives a little bit worse off. That is central and common to human experience. Those are the sorts of trade-offs and questions that people face all the time. And I don't think that we get anywhere by sort of trying to define ourselves out of the problem by saying, hey, even though that thing you're doing is making you miserable, actually, you're actually making your life better, you're leading a better life for having done it. So um, it's true that psychologists primarily make descriptive claims. I think that the normative claim that a welfareist like me would make is that to live a good or moral life is to do your best to increase the welfare of all the people around you as much as you can. And so this would be a morally good activity because you're doing something nice for your roommate even though it's at the expense of your own well-being or happiness. That I think is a very intuitive and common concept to many of us where we think about the trade-offs between being selfish about our own well-being and being altruistic about the well-being of others. And I think that you know, a sort of humanistic conception of what it means to have a life that's going well for you, it, it perfectly captures all of that. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure we're gonna get any mileage out of just trying to sort of uh, change the problem such that we don't you know, face the trade-off. Shall I respond to that? Oh, and my question too. Okay, well let me just, I mean, I think I just wanna highlight like maybe where the deep divide is between, I mean, um, so look, look, on the view that I have, um, so I'm, I'm thinking of happiness connected to virtue, right? Virtues are dispositions of character, right? So if you're a temperate person, um, then it's not only the case that you eat the right amount and you drink the right amount and your sexual appetites are, are, are regulated and you're self-controlled, but that you actually don't want more than that. Right, so a virtuous person has well-trained uh, dispositions. And that means, and, and what does it mean to do that? So Aristotle says that the cultivation of virtue is a training of pleasures and pains, right? It takes a kind of rational self-discipline to be the kind of person who enjoys helping other people. And it can take a long time. I have a lot of kids. I've been a parent now for almost 15 years. And it's been an ongoing training, right, in enjoying, right, helping my kids in things that I could never imagine enjoying, right? Um, and it changes you. Being a parent fundamentally changes you. It changed me. I'm a completely different person now. Um, and it was, in part, a transformation of my pleasures and pains. So when we make claims about, like, like pleasure and pain isn't just descriptive, okay? If I get tickled at seeing you being humiliated, that says something about me, right? It says something about who I am, that that pleases me. Um, and it says something about who I am if it makes me miserable to help other people, right? It suggests that I have some work to do as a person. And the reality is, we all have work to do. No one in this room is perfectly virtuous. You're not, I'm not. Um, but, right, um, but I can aspire to be better, right? Um, and so I think, like, on my view, um, you just have to take on board this idea that as I'm growing in the moral life, right, um, I actually do come to enjoy. Um, not a trade-off. It's not a trade-off for me, right? I, I come to enjoy um, doing things for my kids. Um, and, and, and that's a kind of 
you know, that, I mean, that's, that's a kind of training of desire and a training of, of pleasure and pain. And I think that sort of um, conditioning is possible. I mean, anybody who's raised children knows that you have to entrain their pleasures and pains uh, in similar ways, in, in part so that they can enjoy the life of the family together, right? Sorry, that was fine. Can I, can I say something? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, so now I really want to talk about this because it's the second time that Jennifer has brought it up. So the, the person who enjoys watching someone else be tickled, the Nazi rally, it's the same sort of example, right? So, so let's, let's think about that example for a second. So imagine um, that there are a handful, there are, in this room there are three true sadists who just like it when people around them are suffering. And they hang out together, and they just have a great time watching their fellow students be miserable, be anxious, suffer. They rejoice when they, their fellow students get bad grades. Um, they look for active ways to undermine their fellow students and make their lives worse. Like, true sadists in every sense of the word. Okay. Jennifer would say those are bad people. I would say those are good people. Just kidding. <laughs> Those are obviously bad people. And the reason is that, as I've said, the goal of a moral life should be to try to increase the welfare of the people around you. And these sadists are doing exactly the opposite. They're trying to decrease it, and they're taking joy in it being decreased, among others. So I think we're, we're in total agreement about sort of the morality or the virtue of those actors. We could ask a different question, though, which is like, do those, how, how well are those people's lives going for them? You know, do they think they're leading good lives or not? If we injected them with truth serum and we asked the sadists, you know, how's your life going for you? Would they say to us, you know, you've caught me, like I'm deeply miserable about all this sadism. Or would they say like, actually things are great because like I look around, everyone's miserable, I'm having a great time enjoying that everyone's miserable. You know, I think we don't get any mileage out of pretending that their lives are going bad for them or that they have low welfare. We can still call them bad people. We can denounce their activities. We can punish them. We can look for ways to uh, you know, reform them or, or se separate them from our society. But none of that is in any way dependent, nor is it furthered by, in addition, pretending that somehow their enjoyment of what's going on is any less real than the enjoyment of a good person or an altruist who's taking pleasure in the achievements and satisfaction of everyone else. There isn't any sort of conflict about those ideas. We just have to separate the notion of what it means for someone's life to go well for themselves versus what we as a society believe is morally right and what is owed to all of us by the people who are members of our society. But I'm not pretending that they're not enjoying themselves. Like, but here's the thing is, uh, vicious people enjoy doing vicious things, right? So I'm, I am absolutely not denying that. What I'm denying is that they're happy. So is the, do you see, think the disagreement there is a, a verbal one of the definition of happiness? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, we, I think we clearly disagree about the definition of happiness, but I don't think it's a merely verbal disagreement. I think, um, you know, we, uh, so I, I think I think it's a disagreement about, um, yeah, how to. I think it's a, I think it is a disagreement about happiness, about how we're supposed to think about it and reflect about it and use this concept. So it's a, it's a deep conceptual disagreement, but that's not merely verbal. Okay, I, I agree that it is a deep conceptual disagreement that is not merely verbal. I would describe it as a deep conceptual disagreement about. Um, the, the notion of welfare, or what it means for someone's life to be going well for them. But now I want to say a law thing. We said a lot of philosophy things, a few psychological things, the occasional economics thing, and we say a law thing. I think, you know, in the world that I live in, in the world of law, I'm not sure how much it necessarily matters in the end. As I think about how I want to form policy or how I want to construct my society, I'm not sure that resolving this conceptual disagreement necessarily changes any of the results that we would come to. Both Jennifer and I think the same thing about the sadist and whether the sadist should be venerated or punished. We, we both think the same thing about whether we owe duties to other people in our community. And so at some level, kind of where the rubber meets the road in the world of law and policy, which is the world I inhabit most of the time, 
I, I don't think that these disagreements, maybe there are corners at the margins where we'll find places where we, our views would come apart, but I suspect that these disagreements would actually not lead to major disagreements about how we ought to shape our country's laws, what kind of sanctions we have to have for which kinds of behavior and so forth. So I'm, I'm wondering then, um, you why, in, on your account, should someone be moral? If it isn't the case that morality and, and happiness are somehow entwined, uh, what's the motivation or what's the drive? Uh, if happiness and, and, say, justice are different drives that we have, what's the, what's the basis of the drive for morality? So when you say the basis of the drive, I guess I have to ask, do you mean the psychological drive, or do you mean a sort of normative philosophical drive? Uh, what do you think? <laughs> Say <laughs> well, I mean, Okay, I, I'm gonna since, 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 since David won't specify, I'll answer the question I want to. Um, look, I mean, psychologically, you know, we as a as a species and as a society, it often makes us very happy to act morally and act well towards one another. Um, and we, as we've both said many, many times, you know, one of the ways to achieve the deepest level of happiness and satisfaction, the chief, the greatest positive feelings is to do good things for others, especially people who are emotionally close to you. So psychologically, there's a very powerful impulse to try to act morally and help others, although not powerful enough to make everyone do it. We know lots of cases of people who don't. Philosophically, where does the drive come from? I'm not sure, well, number one, I'm not even sure I know what that means, but number two, I'm not sure that there is such a driver that it exists. I mean, we can say normatively that something is good or something is bad without saying that people will necessarily be compelled to do the good thing. I mean, I think, frankly, if you, if you study law, the sort of the animating impulse of law is that without some kind of social rule, people will in fact not be driven to do the good thing. They will often do the bad thing. And so that's why we need legal rules to constrain people from doing bad things in many cases and to give them the impetus to do good things. So, you know, I think that, I don't think that we necessarily need to believe or should pretend that there will be some kind of normative, philosophical, moral drive to always act well. That either has to come to us psychologically or it has to come from some external source in many cases. Did you want to respond to um, Well, I mean, I think that the goal of the moral life is to be happy and everybody wants to be happy. So I don't have this problem in a sense. I mean, I have other problems, but I don't have that problem. Um, yeah. Is, is that a belief about the world or about the a belief about the meaning of happiness. What I mean is, do you, are you saying that uh, to, you've defined, you have a definition of happiness that includes morality, or morality is constitutive of happiness, or are you saying that we don't face tragic situations where we have to choose between our happiness and morality? Yeah. Um, okay, so I think a lot about tragedy, actually. Um, and you know, it's, it's noteworthy that in Book 8 of the Nicomachean Ethics, um, Aristotle mentions King Prime, and he says specifically, um, you know, Prime was a good man, he was a virtuous man, um, but of course his, his life ended in tragedy, um, and it wasn't his fault, and it can be that way, right? So for Aristotle, the virtue is no guarantee. Like, he's very upfront about that. Um, this is a question that obviously the Stoics answered in a very different way. Um, I think that a life can certainly be tragic in some sense, um, but I and and I also agree that that virtue is no guarantee of happiness. Um, I think humans are 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 very vulnerable creatures. Um, things can fall apart. Um, and it, and it, you know, you, you might be like King Brian, um, but I don't, I don't think that um, admitting that detracts from the claim that the goal of the moral life is to be happy and that virtue is necessary to attain it. Um, because tragedy as a genre is, is all about pointing out um, the extent to which things aren't up to us, right? I mean, 
the way things turn out are not totally in our control, and it's important to be very aware of that. I don't see it as having um, any significance, um, any, any deep significance beyond that. I mean, that's a significant thing, but it doesn't undermine the theory. Thank you. Uh, I've been thinking about the example of someone who's, uh, their spouse is cheating on them, their children are turning out awful, awfully, there's all sorts of problems going on, there are people talk behind their back, all these things. Uh, but the person's blissfully just unaware of all of these things and is quite happy. Uh, another individual, uh, their life is, in, in, in other ways, better. Their spouse is faithful, their children are turning out better, people don't talk behind their backs, but they're aware of some issues here and there, and they would report themselves to be less happy. Um, who's happier? And um, which life would you want for a loved one? Well, I don't. I don't know who's happier because I don't know. I just was like I don't have enough information. I mean, the thing is, like, your happiness can't be measured by like how your kids turn out or like if you're. I mean, if your spouse is cheating on you, that stinks. But like, uh, it's a thing that happens. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily. I mean, I would have to know what kind of person they are. Like on my view, you know, um, and so I can't. I, I don't think you can say um, if somebody's happy by just sort of looking at the external conditions of their life. I think they matter. Um, but I know like really happy people who are dying, who have a terminal illness, um, who like are in conditions that seem you know objectively bad, um, but they're able to make meaning of their suffering and they're able to enjoy a kind of spiritual life that's. Incredibly admirable. So first of all, I mean, I guess I would say I, I, I certainly agree and endorse, uh, agree with and endorse what Jennifer just said about the possibility of being happy despite adverse um, objective circumstances. That's absolutely true, and we have lots of evidence of that. I mean, in fact, one of the major findings of this whole area of psychology is that humans are remarkably adaptable. We're capable of finding happiness, having positive emotions, building connections with people, even if things are going badly for us in lots of different ways. Um, I'm gonna add, answer David's question directly though. It's, it's in like chapter eight of my book, so I feel like I'm obligated to or something, although the answer I'm gonna give is not gonna be as fulsome as the answer that's actually on the printed page. But, um, okay, so my view of all of this obligates me to say that the person whose spouse is cheating on them but who is un blissfully unaware of it and just thinks that everything is going hunky-dory, um, that that person is actually happy. If their experiences, if their emotions that they're feeling are positive all the time and they don't know that there's this sort of bad thing being done behind their backs, the person actually is happy. That the, the fact that the bad thing is happening doesn't make the person's life any worse if it doesn't interfere with their life. This sort of famous hypothetical, this is like the deceived spouse, this is called, it's like a cousin of the experience machine. So it's like the second most famous thing that gets trotted out against uh, he, uh, the hedonic theories of, of well-being. You're probably thinking to yourself, well, that can't be right. Now I'm off the wagon. Like, I've fallen off the wagon here. Like, I, now I don't believe anything he says anymore. Um, but let me suggest, you might very well be thinking that for a lot of reasons that are supposed to be outside of this hypothetical. Like, you're thinking to yourself, well, the person will find out eventually. Well, if the person finds out eventually, then everything changes. Or you're thinking to yourself, you know, the person's relationship with the spouse can't be the same way it was if the spouse wasn't cheating. There must be something, some element of intimacy or some hint of, um, uh, of love that's just missing and gone. Well, that's outside of the hypothetical also. We're not supposed to imagine that. We're supposed to be thinking that this person is completely and entirely unaware and that this person is just, uh, for, for that person, the life hasn't changed at all. Okay, but the, the reason why these hypotheticals keep getting trotted out is because they make us think about other things that are supposed to be outside of the hypothetical. They pump our intuitions. So I'm gonna give you my own hypothetical about this. Okay, so Sheila is an environmentalist and she cares deeply about a particular squirrel that lives in Kenya. The squirrel lives only in Kenya. And she really, really wants the squirrel to survive. 
And so she gives um, a lot of money to an environmental organization, and the environmental organization tries to save the squirrel in Kenya. And then the squirrel either doesn't survive or it does survive. We never know, and Sheila never knows. Sheila never finds out. She never bothers to ask. She never talks to anyone. The environmental organization never gets back to her. It's a fact out in the world that the squirrel lived or died, but Sheila is completely unaware of it. Would you say that Sheila's life is going better, that she has greater welfare if thousands of miles away the squirrel survived, even though Sheila never learned about it? My guess is that would strike all of you as uh, a little bit ridiculous, that the, the, the life, the living or non-living of that squirrel is so remote from Sheila, if she never even learns about it or hears about it, that it can't possibly affect her actual well-being, her own experience of her own life. That's just the deceived spouse without all of the sort of larding up with extra intuitions. So, and, that's, uh, and that's what's animating our, uh, the view about the notion that it's one's experience of life, the emotions and thoughts one feels, that determines whether one is happy and has a lot of well-being or not. Uh, great, thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite uh, Samantha and Henry. They are going to uh, have questions, your questions, prepared uh, for our panel. Um, but I feel like this is more a question for Jonathan than me, because of course I'm just like, the machine's horrible, it should horrify you. Um, um, because I think that you're a real human being and, and you should want to live, you know, a, a really excellent human life. But I do think that, um, you know, so on the Matrix scenario, um, all the humans are like in this nutritive jelly, you know, and they're, they're like born that way. So it's not a question of, well, I have to give up the goods of my happy life. I mean, you would just be born into it, right? And so then the question is, well, is that the sort of lives that we, that we really, would that, would that be horrifying? I mean, because like, they're in the nutritive jelly, they feel good. It's awesome in there, but it's not real. Okay, so first of all, um, everyone should go and see The Matrix immediately if you haven't already, because <laughs> it's a great movie. Um, Secondly, I mean, the movie is a perfect example of why these types of thought experiments are flawed. So, you know, what do we see? Exactly, we see the person from the outside in the nutritive jelly. We see that they are just sort of a blob, disgustingly floating in this little pod while they're being mined for their electricity, exploited by someone else. And it's, it's shown to us um, in a way to, uh, to make it seem as unattractive as humanly possible. And by the way, The Matrix itself, sorry to spoil the movie, um, The Matrix itself, the original version of The Matrix, as they tell us in the movie, everyone lived a blissful life, everyone was happy all the time, and it turns out that humans rebelled against that because they didn't think it could possibly be real. They realized something was going wrong. Um, so they had to make the, the matrix, the, the sort of fiction that people were experiencing, kind of like drudgery and sort of miserable. So the whole thing is built to make us think that being plugged into the experience machine is really terrible, that no one should ever want to live that way. Um, and of course, when we all think about the experience machine, when we hear the example, that's the kind of picture that we get in our minds. Um, so, yeah, like, there are a lot of really bad things about being in a jar and not getting to see your family anymore. Um, but that's different from saying that no one should ever be allowed to uh, go and watch a movie and you know, forget about their life for two hours while they're enjoying something. Or, uh, or for that matter, that we shouldn't, you know, that people shouldn't take quote-unquote happiness pills. I think there was a reference earlier to happiness pills. Like, uh, there are a lot of substances that people consume in the world to make themselves feel a little bit happier for a short period of time, um, ranging from alcohol to pharmaceutical drugs of various types. And those aren't necessarily bad things if they'll make us feel a little bit better. They're often good things.
Yeah, I mean, my, my answer to all the experience machine questions is, this. I've said it already, I'm not gonna say it again. I mean, I think that question, you know, the whole premise of the experience machine is that, the, the premise of the, of the, of the um, thought experiment is that if you posed it to, you know, the world at large, every right-thinking person would say, of course I don't want to be plugged in. I mean, number one, we have no idea whether that's true or not. Um, and number two, um, you know, so th what that means is that the, the proper audience for your question is, you know, everyone else in the room, I guess I would say. Well, I mean, look, so for me, the value of the experience machine is not in the details at all. It's really just to highlight that on this vision of happiness, it really is just completely subjective. So it's divorced from reality. Um, and, and, and so it's just meant to make that feature of it very dramatic. I don't think it has really much value beyond that. Um, and I think that just in hearing you talk about it, you, I mean, you don't see this as a, as a problem with your view, that it's divorced from reality in this way, because you're like, look, like if you were, if, if you really were just inside the experience machine, look, everything would seem really great, and that's all that matters. Like, you just seem happy to bite that bullet. I mean, I guess I disagree with what it means for something to be divorced from reality. So if, if you are experiencing it, if it's part of your conscious experience of life, whether that thing is you know, watching a television show or being plugged into a virtual reality machine or the experience machine or anything else, or just being drunk and kind of stumbling around, you know, if it's part of your experience of life, then it's not divorced from reality. No, it's I'm sorry, Becky, I'm sorry. I, I, I have to fight back against that because look, if I get in a virtual reality machine and I have a beautiful family and a successful job and it all seems great, those things aren't true, right? So, sorry, I meant, maybe I do have a successful job. <laughs> in the next but like, uh, sorry, <laughs> that got weird. But um, <laughs> pretend that these things aren't true of me. I get in a virtual reality machine and they all seem really true. The appearance of truth is not the same as truth. If I think it's raining outside and I have the belief that it's raining, but it's not raining outside, my belief is false, even though it appears to be true. And I want to create space for saying the same thing about happiness. It's a kind of false ersatz happiness. If I have this beautiful experience in a virtual reality machine of my perfect life. It's not real. Yes, it seems subjectively real, but I am more than a subjectivity, right? And you can, I mean, and, and this is just a fact. And there is, and it's also just a fact that my subjective experience might not fully reach the objective reality. This is true of a lot of people who are self-deceived. Um, and I don't think we want to say people who are self-deceived that they're happy or they're living well. And I just think that's a very deep disagreement between us. Ah, what a great question. Why off wants to live a life worth imitating? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you should just live an excellent life. And an excellent life would be worthy of imitation. Um, I, I, I sort of adopted the language of aspiration and imitation because I think that, you know, that's typically the perspective of people who are, if you're trying to think about what's happiness or what's the highest good, um, then you're in a frame of thinking about what's worthy of my devotion, what's worthy of imitation. Um, the assumption is that you don't, you don't have it yet. Um, I don't think that when you're deliberating, um, the thing that you're most concerned about is whether or not what you're doing is worth imitating. But I do think, actually, it should always be something, um, it, it, it should somehow be part of your practical self-consciousness. So if you're doing something um, shameful, um, then, insofar as you're able to see it as shameful, you realize that, like, you don't want people to imitate it. So a lot of people will, like, change their behavior radically around children. Um, so, for instance, um, you know, people come in my house, I've got a lot of young kids, and all of a sudden they stop dropping F-bombs all the time. Right? They sort of realize, like, well, I don't want Jen's kids to be doing this, right? Um, or, you know, they, um, and, and I think this awareness, right, that 
actually the way that I act, you know, it does affect other people, especially if I'm in a position of power and responsibility. Um, so you might think of the way um, someone who occupies the offices, the office of the presidency behaves. Um, you might want that to be worthy of imitation, um, given that that's a person who represents our country to the world. Um, so I think it's a, I think it's like a part of your practical self-consciousness, but it's not like your, it's not like your goal, right? Again, like on, on my view, of the goal is to live a life that is deeply fulfilling and, and satisfying for you as a human being. But that sort of life would, I think, be worthy of imitation. This is the uh, fried chicken. I know, this is the fried chicken and cocaine question again. Um, I, didn't, I didn't mean to indicate that I thought that the answer to that question was yes, you should. I, I mean, I don't know, this is, this is gonna feel like sort of a truism, but the answer is that it's, it's better to have 40 years of happy life than to have three minutes of happy life. I, I mean, I would think that that should be obvious, um, that if your life is made up of your experience of it, all of the, the sum of all of the moments of what you were feeling and experiencing for that whole time, that 40 years of those moments, assuming that they're good moments, is much better than three minutes, um, and that we should not sacrifice uh, that long-term um, joy and, and, uh, and well-being in exchange for sort of three minutes of, of extreme pleasure or something like that. I, I mean, that seems to me totally obvious and exactly in keeping with the way that we all live our lives all of the time, basically, where we're willing to make trade-offs, I mean, even much more extreme trade-offs between short-term uh, pain, short-term struggle for long-term satisfaction or contentment. Jen, did you want to respond to that? Um, I think that, um, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, my own view is that it sort of depends on the circumstances. So um, I think some people have very short lives, um, but they have very heroic lives um, or, or lives um, that are incredibly noble, such that the shortness of it doesn't seem to detract from it. And then I think other people have sort of like very long, seemingly normal lives, um, where maybe they're you know mostly happy in in your sense. And I think it's I think it's difficult to compare these things exactly. Um, I mean, I, I think the basic question that people should should really be asking themselves is, you know, what 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 is the best sort of life I can live? And in your circumstances, it might end up being short, right? You might, I don't know, like your country might break out in civil war, and so you've got to live a life of self-sacrifice and, and you're gonna die young, but it could be a very noble sort of life. It, it could, in fact, um, it, it, it could end up being being more noble than you know whatever other kind of normal life you you could have had. So I, I think it depends on the circumstances and how you how you meet those circumstances, which are in most cases not under your control. Just I'll just say very quickly. I mean we've covered this ground a little bit, but I'll, I'll just say again um, the the short life of self sacrifice might very well be a better life from a stance of morality, a better life from a stance of virtue um, and nobility than the long sort of banal life, right? If you give yourself to a greater cause and you make the lives of the people around you much better, you have at some level lived, you have lived a morally better life, a more virtuous life than if you stood by, did nothing, but made it to old age. Um, that's the difference again between conception of what it is to live a moral, a good life in the sense of a moral life and a life uh, of a great deal of welfare. If you struggle a lot and you accomplish something wonderful for the people around you, but it comes at great personal cost and pain to you and then you die young, I don't think we gain anything by pretending that that person like, had a lot of well-being and that their life went awesome for them. We should say that that was a person who sacrificed themselves and were, was willing to lead uh, a short and unpleasant life for the good of people around them, a noble and virtue and, and morally, um, morally admirable activity, but not something that means that they have a lot of well-being themselves.
Yeah, I don't think there's ever a point of no return for people. Um, I I think that people can always turn it around. Um, I do think that. Um, I mean, I'm I'm obviously committed to the idea that if they're if they're bad, vicious people, they're not really happy. Um, they might have a lot of pleasure in their life or welfare in, in Jonathan's sense. Um, they might be very wealthy. They might have a lot of power. Um, but I I don't think that they would have the deepest, um, most important um, human goods and the characteristic joys that come from. Um, realizing those goods in your life, um, and and I think there's plenty of evidence for that um, commitment of mine. Um, so so, but in the case of someone who is bad, um, I am actually pretty optimistic about the human capacity to turn things around. Um, but I think that the more vicious you are, the harder it is actually for you to see um, see reality clearly. So this is um, this is a commitment that Aristotle has. He thinks that vice is actually a narrowing down of your perception of the world. Um, and so you you don't if you're a selfish person, you don't actually see other people in need. You don't notice them. Um, you don't see, um, you're, you're just sort of not able to see and respond to the world in a way that, um, in a way that an excellent person would. Um, but I still don't think that you're, I don't think you're beyond the pale. I don't think any human being is ever totally lost. I'm going to invite Henry up, um, but as I do, He'll have some instructions for you in a moment. Uh, as you, please join me in thanking both the organizers and our. Family.